the world changes quickly and, and everyone can have a voice. And once everyone starts having a voice, you start realizing that what's true about health and what you've heard about health are not necessarily the same thing. Welcome to Back to the Future podcast. My name is Victor Sadia, and I talk with brilliant minds and hearts of people who want to uproot and transform the current health and wellness paradigm. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Today we have James Maskell. James Maskell is one of the most important voices changing the health paradigm in the world. He's a serial entrepreneur innovating at the intersection of functional medicine and community. Maskell is an international speaker and has appeared on TEDMED, HuffPost Live, Later Future, and TEDx. His two revolutionary books have motivated and guided hundreds of professionals to enter what he calls the evolution of medicine. So James, I'm always curious about how the whole of your career started. Could you just uh, tell us a little bit about the first years? Yeah, so I was the weird kid at school that did natural health. It was kind of forced upon me by my parents. Um, I was the only kid in school that knew what a chiropractor was. I was the only kid actually who parents, it was like on a piece of paper by the phone at the school saying, James's parents must be called before antibiotics. And this was in the 80s. And so, you know, my parents didn't really have any medical training, but they had, you know, subscribed to this kind of care. And I was just forced upon me. And I didn't realize that it was abnormal until I got to school and realized no one saw the things that I saw. And then um, I had a sort of rebellious phase. I went into doing economics and I did a, my degree was in health economics. And I started to see very clearly just sort of the things that were driving healthcare costs and some issues that seemed somewhat insurmountable. And I just kind of realized that there were things in my childhood that were different that were not sort of like uh, old rituals, but new, you know, new ways of thinking about what could be. And so uh, I just decided after a year thinking that I need to be an investment banker out of university, I quit my job, I moved to America and I started working in healthcare, working at a clinic that was really focused on chronic disease reversal. And that was the sort of the beginning of the journey to understand what was happening and, and how we could get more of it. What called you to health economics? You know, I, I did economics. I, I'd studied it um, before university and in A-levels and I was good at it. I think the health was just a, like an interesting thing that I was, you know, the lecturer was good. But there was a part of it that just sort of resonated with me, particularly with one microeconomic. So the first year, everyone takes all the same training in economics. And then second and third year, you can sort of go a little deeper into subjects that you're interested in. So I love my microeconomics teacher and he taught food economics in, uh, in the second year. And also, you know, this concept of negative externalities or externalities on health. I was also aware at the same time of even in my own health, health issues being caused by external factors. Actually, I haven't really talked about this before, but it is true that I used to play a lot of cricket, right? It's an English game. I was really good at it. And I used to play it every day during the summer for six, seven years on end. And part of that game, which has actually just been outlawed now because of COVID, is that you lick your finger and you wipe it on the ball and you rub it because you want to try and get one side of the ball to be shiny or not. Well, on all of these cricket pitches, there's a lot of pesticides and herbicides and all these things being used because they want to create the perfect kind of green carpet. So I did a test when I was like 20, I came over to some friends in, in Georgia who were in the integrated medicine world and I ended up taking a heavy metals test and seeing that my pesticide uh, you know, levels were off the charts because I'd just been doing this nonstop for, for seven years. So that was the first thing that really hit me where they were saying, oh yeah, pesticides have an effect on your health. This is like the year 2000. And so I was kind of hooked. And then now I'm sitting in health economics and going, oh yeah, the environment might be contributing towards health costs. And I'm like, okay, I just saw that for myself. So it was all just like, it started pointing me towards things. And it really took a moment of me just sitting back and having a moment to really reflect on what I wanted to do with my life. Some One of my mentors gave me a great piece of advice, said you should be at the bottom of a ladder that you want to climb. Okay. And at the, in the investment bank, I was definitely, I could see what the people above me did and it looked terrible. And so I just decided that I was going to just get involved in health creation. I knew I wanted to make my own stuff. I was creative. I wanted to have 
uh, my own company. And so the journey to there was was uh, by working in a clinic. And then I started doing sales, selling to doctors, doing different forms of chronic disease reversal, integrated medicine, lifestyle medicine, functional medicine. And those were sort of like my, my entry point into really understanding, you know, what's happening when people are reversing their chronic illness. Like, is it possible? How is it possible? What diseases get reversed? What are common factors across all diseases? What are unique factors to certain diseases? What are unique combinations of root causes for certain types of diseases? And that was sort of a, a, a journey that took me, you know, up until today. And at that moment in time, when, when they were talking about the possibility of reversing chronic disease, how does that conversation has changed in the last decades or so? Well, I think a lot more people realize that it's possible, right? If you go back 2005 to when I'm working in this clinic, there was nothing really about this. You know, you had Mercola had his newsletter. Um, there was no social media. You have to, you have to remember, right, that pre-social media, everyone got their information from basically one or two sources right mainstream news which today doesn't feel you know still doesn't you know figure any of this information the only way that this information has got out is because in the world of social media people talk to each other right and so my lived experience is relevant to you whereas my lived experience only transferred to you in one-on-one -on -one conversations or in groups and you know one person's lived experience was not science i think that in the last 15 years what you started to see is you started to see people talking to each other and groups of people who think the same getting together and validating their own experience and so ultimately you know the, the information has traveled That's been backed up by new science. That's been backed up by a slew of books and podcasts and summits. And you have to, I remember listening to the first, the first podcast that I ever knew existed was in 2005. Ricky Gervais did a podcast. I just moved to America and I loved it. And I was like feeling homesick for uh, leaving England. And that was the first time I, I heard a podcast. It took me, took me nine years to start my own. And here we are, what, 15 years later and whatever, just the other yeah. day, Joe Rogan's podcast, $100 million dollars to Spotify. So, you know, the world changes quickly and, and everyone can have a voice. And once everyone starts having a voice, you start realizing that what's true about health and what you've heard about health are not necessarily the same thing. You came from a world that typically was thought outside of health in general or making an impact in health. We don't see many economists there. How were you received when you had all these dreams of being part of the conversation and facing doctors and health professionals? Well, you know, I only just really kind of outed myself as an economist with my last book because that was actually the original thinking was like, how do you get the cost of healthcare to go down? I didn't really talk about that for 15 years. You know, first I was just, the first seven years was just learning. I was running a clinic, I was selling, and I realized very quickly my experience in running a clinic was going to be, was really, I realized that I knew something that doctors didn't, which was how to organize and run a practice delivering this kind of care. Because it just so happened that the first clinic that I worked in was like the best run clinic I've still ever seen. Operations manual, six inches thick, you know, just they had so much experience running day spas that they had every process documented. And when I went into every other clinic when I was, when I was selling to those, no one have this so that's when i just realized okay i've got an advantage here and beginning in 2010 was the first time that i spoke in front of doctors as like a practice management teacher and i was talking about one how to like market your practice but more importantly i was talking about how to use the internet to create efficiencies in a practice that would not be obvious if you didn't have those tools so touching things like education touching things like you know internal systems And so that was sort of my positioning and that's how I got doctors to know, like, and trust me because I was helping them with uh, some of the more, more cumbersome parts of running a medical practice that, you know, they didn't really know how to do. And what was your first contact with functional medicine? So I was a sales rep and for three years, I didn't go to any other conferences apart from the ones that I put on. Um, you know, with it was no budget. I was hustling and I would put on my own little conferences in tiny hotels in like some of the, you know, worst places in America, uh, like Stanford, Connecticut, if you've ever been there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in 2010, in January of 2010, I had just moved to New York and I decided to get a ticket to go to the integrated health symposium, which was basically like a six, 700 the per doctor symposium in New York. It was the biggest integrated medicine event there at that time. And I went and I was like, oh, this is interesting because 
up until then, most of the people I were working with were like acupuncturists, chiropractors. But now I saw like there were lots of physicians here and I heard Jeff Bland give a lecture and because I'd heard about him, but I'd never seen him or heard anything about him. And I sat in the back and I was like, you know, this sounds this sounds like it's operating at a level of science that mo the doctors would get and want to be part of. And he was really hitting in some of the key issues with cardiometabolic disease and, and type 2 diabetes and heart disease and all these big killers that were you know driving health costs. So that was the moment that I was like, okay, this guy's interesting. And then it was two years later at the same conference where I sat in with a lecture with Christy Hughes, who was a big trainer for the Institute for Functional Medicine. And that was a, a sort of a training on the functional medicine and system and then I realized at that moment that that functional medicine had a real shot at being an agent of transformation in a way that these other medicine names didn't mainly because there was a system where everyone did it the same and that's what I was really looking for as far as like someone who thinks about scale and thinks about growing up like in my experience of going around to these hundreds of different clinics actually thousands of different clinics I made 40 outbound phone calls a day five years so I like I called everyone and what I what I found was there were a whole army of practitioners all aiming at the same thing which is to get people off medication to get people well to have people be sort of independent of their care and and all of those things had a lot of things in common but they all spoke a slightly different language and they didn't really understand each other and it was really actually hampering their ability to connect and most importantly the patient was confused right because all these the, the language was just all over the place and so when i saw functional medicine i was like hang on a minute like there are th things here that are consistent amongst all providers um the timeline like everyone takes a detailed history right so a detailed history this timeline piece here there's the like fundamentals of health creation the things that you can do to improve your health like eating sleeping exercising stress and and community and that was in there and then there was some sort of like agreed upon structure on how the body broke down and i think that was really important too because ultimately people started to you know one thing that that functional medicine really uh, sort of engaged me on was it's pretty obvious to me anyway that like you have and this is actually an economics concept called you know quality adjusted life years is based on this concept but like everyone starts with health 100 and then when you die you're at zero and at some point on that continuum you get labeled with a disease normally let's say 30 or 40 let's say out of 100 so there's this gap between 140 where you've got no disease name and you haven't been categorized and put into the system but your trajectory is definitely towards death and you know you could arrest that number and go back up to 100 potentially but you have to do things differently than you're doing before and so i saw this group of practitioners has the potential to go up but like they're not using the same language no one's really like laying it out as e even as simply as i did just then it was all a lot of like words that were hard to understand it was quite esoteric and so that's when i realized okay functional medicine i think is where it needs to be and then in 2000 13, my partner and I, we've been doing tiny events for seven years, like in yoga studios. And we worked out a few things in those events that led to the Functional Forum, which was the show that I started being a hit on the first episode. And it was a sort of a 90 minute live show hosted by me. I curated all the different speakers and it was really a meetup in New York for doctors that were interested in this topic. And, you know, by the fourth episode, we were streaming live and, you know, we've, we're 77 episodes in today. We've been doing it the first Monday of every month for almost six, more than six years. So you saw the potential of functional medicine. How did you see yourself at that point? Like the person who you now are or that just, took time. Yeah, and no, I've, I've thought about me being this person right since the beginning, honestly. Like, I, my feeling hasn't changed. And I can, my wife will tell you, like in 2012, I'm sitting at home, like frustrated that no one knows who I am. I haven't really done anything of any sort of reasonable structure. Like I really wanted to try and do be of service and, and make something happen. And I could see that it needed to happen. I could see that I had the pieces and that it just hadn't come together yet. So I've always seen myself in that way. You know, our goal with the Functional Forum was to make it cool and aspirational 
to want to practice medicine like this. That was the goal. Because Gabe and I, you know, I guess we felt like we were cool. Like we listened to cool music, we're into cool stuff. And so we wanted to make it. So, you know, the intro music was the beginning of the Daft Punk intro for that day. We, we had to scrub it off the internet because then we didn't get banned. But I had like awesome intro music and we used all the hashtags and, you know, we were just trying to do what we could to distribute the content, you know, out to all the different places where it needed to go. And so, you know, that was the beginning. And I don't think it stayed as cool over time because I've had a lot of other things to do. For two years, that was my jam. And I just did that all the time. And I would spend ages picking the right song that people would come on to, just like a batter in baseball comes on to like their song. You know, I wanted to just make it a real experience to participate. After 2016, you know, it just it just became one of 10 things that I was doing. And so, you know, we've still been consistent on it. I hope to bring back some of that showmanship in the future, but I feel like I really have more of an idea now on what it takes to move the needle. And after two years of just getting eyeballs on the show, I realized like, we gotta do more. Like, we gotta make it happen. We gotta like really get in there with doctors and help them to make the switch to functional medicine. So it's cool to be a functional medicine doctor, but how are you actually gonna like switch your practice across and actually do it? Like, so our, our metrics went from, hey, how do we get the most eyeballs on the show to how do we get the most functional medicine doctors? And now the new metric all these years later is how do you get more people to have access to this operating system and use it and get better? And so I think our, our metrics, our sort of internal key performance indicators have moved along as as we realized, okay, this is good, but we wanna go bigger. We wanna have more impact. We wanna change more people's lives. We wanna actually change the system. And so even today, you know, I see I'm in a lot different position where I see what can happen. And also, I can also, uh, people are starting to realize, I guess, that my ideas are good. And so, you know, we're starting to get a lot more partnerships and traction and organizations thinking, hey, this guy's like onto something. Maybe we should like try and partner with him in some way. And that's been kind of the last few years. Yeah, so let's let's talk about those three steps. First, eyeballing the new paradigm, then empowering people to start doing it, and then really giving impact and, and, and scope. What are the, the key steps in getting eyeballs into this new way of thinking? For, for doctors or for patients? I, I'd say both. You know, for doctors, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because doctors are busy, right? Doctors have a lot of stuff going on. They're seeing patients all the time. The first iteration of doctors who came into this medicine came to it because of either themselves or a family member getting sick and realizing they didn't have the toolkit to get that person well and realizing they needed to expand their toolkit. And that's literally the first thousand doctors doing this all have that pretty much that same story. Jeff Bland is like a, you know, a savant who could just think it that it was and saw it in the literature and his, you know, his nutrition biochemistry, but most doctors, that was their journey. I think in the last five years, we've seen a sort of a doctor that wants to get out of the rat race and wants to like control their own destiny and doesn't want to take insurance and wants to just have a real relationship with his patients. That's the new group that's joining functional medicine because they're like, yeah, this is like part of who I am and part of what I want to be. So that's, that's a, a big piece. And then, you know, now I think there's a really incredible opportunity right now because Healthcare is shifting because so many of these doctors are out of business in America because of COVID. And so I think just in the next six months, there's another opportunity to really go after doctors and give them a pathway towards practicing in this way. And that's kind of where we are now. So that's the doctor side of things. And also I'll go one step further before I come back to patients, systemic change, right? So there's, there's a lot more now examples of systems using functional medicine, like the Cleveland Clinic, like Adventist Health, where these organizations are realizing we can't solve problems that we have with the way that we're doing it. And we need to think differently about how we're doing it. And all credit to people like Mark Hyman for beating that drum for years as to systemic change and you know what it takes to do that. And the Cleveland Clinic is a great example of what's going on there. So I think there's some, there's some progression on that end. And some people change because they want to be leaders like the Cleveland Clinic, right? Who want to be cutting edge. And so they do new stuff that no one else is doing because they have a reputation for that. Some people do it because it's just part of their like ethos 
Athos. So Adventist health is based on um, the Seventh Day Adventists. It's like a blue zone in the Los Angeles Bowl, right? So they they're all about community. They're all about health, and so you know they have their reasons for doing it. And then some groups are starting to look at it because they realize that for the first time in a group delivered functional medicine, which is an innovation I wrote about in my second book that came out in January, that actually it could be profitable. And one of the things that has held back systems from adopting this kind of medicine is that it was not, it was quite hard to work out how to make it profitable because of the long appointments and there's not that many doctors doing it. It's hard to recruit and it's hard to bill insurance for it. So uh, that's on the systemic level. And then on the patient level, there's been a lot of people doing quite a good job of getting the word out, you know, uh, you, Mark Hyman has 13 New York Times bestsellers. You know, there's been best-selling books in every niche of functional medicine, gut, hormones, brain, all the way down. Um, summits, tele-documentary series, peer-to-peer -peer networking models, like all of those things and social media have created a, a structure where the word has got out. And that's why, look, in 1993, a third of people took supplements. Now it's like 70%. Everyone kind of realizes that, you know, that if you stop watching TV, which is sponsored by pharmaceutical ads, that you can create health by actually eating healthy nutrients. And it's not rocket science. And so I think we've seen, you know, some growth into the market at this point. Ultimately though, what it's gonna take to really transform is to connect people who aren't really consumers to it. And the people who aren't really consumers is kind of like the lowest 40% on the socioeconomic ladder who don't really get to make choices, right? It's not a lifestyle thing that has made them sick. It's the fact that they can't get water and they have to live on Coke, or, you know, they, uh, they don't have a healthy grocery near them, or, you know, there's 15 fast food joints within a walk of their house, but nowhere to get a salad, you know? So, and the salad is five times more expensive than the burger. You know, so those kind of like systemic issues are what is gonna be needed to change the system. And, and, and that's sort of like the final bastion. And I think that, um, but there's there's people starting to really talk about what it would take to do that. And I'm, I'm more hopeful than ever that a lot of smart people are kind of thinking what could happen for that to be a reality. Tell us a, a little bit about the Cleveland Clinic adopting this new possibility and putting their name on the line by trying it out as the first big health institution to do so. Yeah, so I'm actually quite like connected to this in a really fun way in that the fourth episode of my show in May 2014, I had booked Mark Hyman to come on. And I, the story about how I got him to come on is legendary and I'll tell you it to some time, but put it this way, I had to become like a chauffeur and pick him up at the airport and convince him in the car ride that, that I should be, that he should come and speak on the show. But anyway, I did and he came and he announced the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine like on the show. And, and, it, we, and for the first time ever, the streaming worked. Right, so we had seven, 8,000 people watch the show and we're like, oh my God, there's gonna be a Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. It was, it was amazing. And so that was the first piece. Uh, so then it started and it started small. They had a couple doctors and Mark moved to Cleveland and you know, they started doing it. And in three years time, basically it was way too busy. Like they had 2,000 people on the waiting list and they couldn't fill quickly enough. And it was, you know, all the same problems of doing functional medicine that have been in any system, which is not enough doctor. You know, they, you know, they couldn't really ratchet it up fast enough. And you think the kind of people that are coming to the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine is like chronically ill people. So the next thing that happened was Tawny Jones, who I featured in my recent book, she was the sort of uh, manager of the whole thing. And she decided that they should run these groups, 10 week groups run by physician assistant, health coach and dietitian, where it would be sort of like a prerequisite to see the doctor. And if you made it through those 10 weeks and you charged on insurance, then you could go and get to see the doctor. And ultimately that they were gonna sort of do a lot of the heavy lifting of the lifestyle in a group without the doctor. And it's a smash hit. Like it couldn't be more awesome in terms of like the results that have, have yet to be published, but I've seen the raw data. I mean, half the people completely transform their health, lose the, all their diagnoses and get better. One, because you're solving the biggest determinant of health, which is loneliness. You're introducing people who want to get healthy to each other, creating new communities that are empowering. And then two, 
you now have a structure whereby which people can actually ongoingly activate healthy behaviors. And that's the biggest deal for me. Like that's a real game changer where now you have sort of like 15 or 10 or six free accountability buddies where you're able to go through a process with them of learning to be healthy. And I think that's really a big, the probably the biggest piece of all is just having a structure where healthy behaviors become the norm. And so that's that's what's happened. So the results are amazing. It's called Functioning for Life. It was just about to launch when COVID hit and I expect it to come out very soon and it to be like an engine for adoption of these ideas into the system. Yeah, so I'm curious about your last book, um, The Community Cure. So you put together all these ideas about the power of community. And once you put it in a book, it seems like it's already a solid topic and a solid subject and a solid tool. But before the book, I, you know, we, we had these papers and we had these doctors all over the country. They didn't come together in the same place. So the question here is, what was the process of writing the book? And how do you think that a book that puts all this knowledge into the same place really can be used to es escalate this, both in the medical and the just general public? Well, so, uh, so in, 2000, in 2018, I went back to the Cleveland Clinic and I saw them doing the groups. And so I was like, oh man, that was awesome. Because I'd, I'd heard about group visits even five years before when I spoke before the Functional Forum, I had heard about group visits and I thought it's a great idea because I see that now maybe like poor people could really access this kind of care. And then, um, so then I came back after that experience. I was like, what shall I do next? And I was like, I'm going to write a book on group visits. And, or maybe I hadn't decided it was going to write a book. What I decided was I wanted to meet everyone who was already doing group visits. So I put out an email to my list and I was just like, hey, anyone who's doing any sort of group medicine, I want to hear from you. And I got maybe a dozen responses from people and I started to record podcasts. So we made a series called the Group Visit Series where we have 13 episodes of people doing different innovations in groups, you know, in systems, in primary care, in, you know, whatever that looks like. So we did that and it was a great success and people were really into it. The first interview that I recorded was with someone who, who had, some, everyone had said, hey, you've got to meet Jeff Gala. you've got to meet Jeff Gala. he's the man. He's the godfather of the integrated medicine group visit. So I interviewed him and the interview, the first call I had with him was so good. I was like, I'm gonna, this is the book. In fact, because I could realize that he was an incredible hero for the book, because this is a guy who had basically been doing group visits in like the poorest parts of Massachusetts and helping undocumented immigrants like create resilience and health by just being with each other and engaging in healthy behaviors. So as soon as I did that interview, I was like, okay, I know this is the book. And I just followed the same formula from my first book, which is really a hero's journey sort of methodology. My goal with the first book was, could I give it to a doctor? And at the end of it, they'd be like, yes, I want to practice like this. And then the goal with the second book was if I handed this to like a hospital administrator, would they read it and go, wow, we should definitely be doing this in our clinic. So that's, that's kind of, um, that's the journey of the book. And it was awesome to do it. I really enjoyed meeting all the different people. It's amazing like that. What was in chapter seven of the book, which was the future is now the present because of COVID. So virtual group visits, remote patient monitoring is the sort of the newest thing. And uh, I think it's pretty, pretty cool. How do you see the fact that we need to put these tools, the community cure and, and functional medicine principles and, and all these things that you so eloquently talk about and have proven that it works in so many levels in education, in the first years of medical education? Is that something that we see in the near future for the US at least? Or it's still very rock solid, the, the curricula that they are still offering? Uh, look, I'm a bit of a contrarian on this because I'm not a doctor. I actually don't care about medical education. Like, I think it's cool and good luck it just like seems like it's going to be the slowest thing ever to move because you've got you know people have to die before you can change the curriculum right you got all these tenured professors and they come up with a curriculum and they've been teaching it the same way forever it just seems like that's going to be so slow i feel like where the where the real juice is is you know what's what is a health coach right you may have heard that terminology what is the difference between a health coach and a doctor right a doctor is has 10 years of training super specialized really 
really there and was the whole of medical education was created around you know diagnostics for you know instant diagnostics for people who are really sick right you come in with an infection you come in you've been hit by a bus you want a doctor who can come in call the shots make it happen and save you that model for chronic disease is a horrible 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 failure right because the doctors don't know anything about what causes it they can't really they don't know how to change behavior and they're just not trained to do it. And a little training in nutrition isn't gonna do it either. I mean, you're literally talking, but the difference between acute and chronic disease is so massive, right? That one doesn't just change into the other or just evolve into the other. You're literally talking about the opposite plan, right? The opposite of the doctor coming up with the plan is the patient coming up with the plan, right? And so the health coach for me is this interesting position because typically a health coach, one, has recovered from their own chronic illness, right? You don't just become a health coach because you're into health. I guess some people do, but most people burn out, get sick, work out how to get themselves better. And then like, oh, that was like, I learned a lot. I should be teaching other people to do this. So there's a really powerful force there in like having a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with someone who's actually done it. That's a big deal. And then the second is, you know, look at on the fundamentals of health creation and in, in functional medicine. How do you actually create the right accountability and support structures to help big groups of people make that transition? And I feel like the health coach is the key. So rather than expect expecting that the doctor's gonna miraculously turn into an epic health coach. Why not just put health coaches on the front lines of chronic disease? And if the doctor needs to get involved, that's great, right? We can use the functional medicine doctor when the lifestyle alone has not led to the change that the patient wants to see. And that ultimately with exactly the resources that we have today, right? We don't need some change in medical education that might take 20 years. With exactly the resources that we have today, we could transform the system. It just means like, I guess, think about it this way. Think about how you would end up in conventional medicine, how you would, if, if what you really need is a health coach, someone who can hold you accountable to doing the things every day that you need to do to, stay, to be healthy, right? If you, if you really need that, think about what process you have to go through in order to be prescribed that in the system. Step one, go to a primary care doctor. Step two, get a drug. Step three, get another drug, like five steps in there. Step six, go to a you know specialist. Seven, another specialist. Eight, another specialist. Nine, to another new doctor. 10, 11, 12. Step 15 is you go to a functional medicine doctor. The functional medicine doctor puts you on their functional medicine protocol. Step 16, he finally asks you the question, hey, what's going on? Like, you, you said you wanted to get better. I gave you this great protocol. Like, why aren't you doing what you thought you were doing? Oh, well, you know, whatever the answer is. Typically trauma, right, is driving people's behaviors. And guess what? That What I just described is unbelievably traumatic. So then now, 17 steps later, you now get paired with a health coach somehow, some way and you've already spent thousands of dollars over here on all the copays and drugs and all the other bullshit you never needed and now you've got the health coach there and you get into a process you start doing the healthy behaviors your labs start getting better you start you know being in a better mood you start improving your relationships improve like all of these things and the whole thing is like we could just disintermediate the whole thing disintermediate all those other people that did nothing to help me get healthy and just start with the health coach and just have that relationship of someone who's been there, who's reversed their chronic disease. That to me is not that big of a, that's not that crazy of an idea. And ultimately that's my vision for chronic disease management. Start with the health coach and follow a principle called the naturopathic therapeutic order. All it says is we start for chronic disease. We start with the least costly, least invasive interventions first and move our way up towards more costly, more invasive interventions like drugs and surgery last. If that doesn't make sense to you as a human, you obviously haven't seen the results of, you know, how many people are caused harm by the medical system. If that doesn't appeal to you as an economist, you know, you don't have to be an economist to realize that we're spending so much money doing all the wrong things that are completely inappropriate. And ultimately, like, this is just an idea I feel as time has come. And I'm gonna tell everyone until I'm, I'm gonna do this for 30 years until people 
get to realize that if we want to create health in the population, we need groups, we need health coaches, we need technology, and doctors can be there for everyone else. Like we don't have enough doctors anyway. We have a shortage of doctors. So let's just get the other people in the right place and let them do their doctoring. We'll have less harm, we'll have better results, and it'll cost less. That's uh, so eloquent and, and I'll be there for you to support you in that endeavor. Definitely very clear vision. And if we're going to walk that path of demedicalizing health, and it's not really about the doctor, but about the person, we need to think about how to broaden our definition of health and wellness. Because we, we just, traditionally we think that the person who knows more about our health is our doctors. And now we're seeing that that's really good for the acute part of the problem, but not for the chronic and the just health creation in general. So how can we broaden this definition? How can we harness the, the power of, of this new wave of doctors who are really understanding this, but going further and not only uh, relying on doctors to broaden this definition? Well, I think I think it's starting to happen. It's not really, you know, it's, it's starting to happen kind of by itself. I mean, you see big organizations starting to realize that they have to, they're going to have to implement changes in the social determinants of health to change health, which is a big step. Now, how they do that in an affordable way is still I think a bit of a mystery in my book I showed how group visits can be a really effective way to help people solve each other's problems right so it's not just like help from on high but it's actually facilitating communities so that problems can be solved dynamically behind by the group itself which I think is certainly a part of the, the plan um, but yeah I mean Ultimately, I think what COVID shows us is that people that look the same have a dramatically different response to the same stressor. And one of the concepts that I talked about in my book is this idea of moving to kind of what they call precision public health. So rather than focusing on things that are good for everyone, the average human focus on creating lots of healthy individuals. And how do we do that? We need people to participate and that can be facilitated through technology coaching or groups and ultimately you know we need to you know we need to do that at the at the the most obvious level possible and you know, you know you don't have i don't know what this what the thing is in mexico but i i certainly feel like the government has a potential to to play this kind of role uh you know i think you could have these kind of this kind of content uh on tv i think you could have content like you know you're seeing efforts already now to find ways to use social media to get the word out i mean david katz who i uh had a chance to listen to is i think be one of the clearest thinkers when it comes to to covid you know, he shared that we really need like a national get healthy campaign. And I think that we saw by everyone staying at home for months and months on end, how willing people are to do things that are new because of helping their fellow man. And ultimately, you know, we need to harness that kind of energy uh, for, a, for a worldwide chronic disease reversal campaign. Um, you'll see that, you know, that the philanthropists that are at the center of this health thing with COVID, there's one area of health where they never seem to like really get involved. And that is empowering people to reverse their chronic illness. And if you look at all of the, you know, all of the information that's put out, all of the efforts that are done, it really never looks at social determinants of poor people. If you start to, you know, that's really why. And so, you know, ultimately it will take, I think, a combination of other philanthropists, government, and then just actually communities themselves. And one of the things that I shared in my book is, a, is an economist called Raghuram Rajan. And he's a, he's, he was the IMF head economist for years. And I think he's the head economist in, in India. He wrote a book called The Third Pillar. And he said, look, we always think that it's up to like either government or markets to solve these problems in all, in all areas of health, in all areas of the world, but particularly in, in, in healthcare. And that couldn't be more obvious than in America, right? We have Democrats who are like Medicare for all and Republicans who are like, the, you know, the market will solve the problem. But truly what he advocates for in his book is the reason why we only see that there's two options is because this third pillar of community has been decimated by technology. And that ultimately all of the best solutions that are the best outcomes at the lowest cost revolve around groups of people coming together to solve each other's problems. And that's the clearest that I can make it as, as to what has to happen. I love it. So in Mexico, we're beginning to really talk about these issues in a bigger community. I what would be your, your best advice for us that we're starting this conversation in a more communal, organized, standardized, uh, knowledge and motivation driven conversation? Well, look, at first, I think you have to find a way to bring the change makers together. 
right? To put people in the same room. You know, it's really amazing to look back at the functional forum and see, you know, relationships that were created in those early forums, what those turned into five years down the road and what impact those things had. So I think getting community together to introduce people who want to be part of the revolution to each other and really getting clear as to what that looks like, coming up with kind of like a real, you know, alignment documents about what they kind of change they want to see. And then I think from there, it's about using the three structures that we've spoken about, technology, coaches, and groups to be able to facilitate the most amount of health. And I think those things are not unique to Mexico. Those things are the same. You, Mexico has some unique issues, right? You, Mexico has some unique vulnerabilities. You, need, you know, Mexico has some unique strengths. And I think coming up with a plan that plays to those strengths, like the plan that would be the plan in America is different than the plan in Mexico, I mean, America has one functional medicine doctor in every town. So it's, you know, they've got more of an ecosystem by which to do something at scale. Mexico may need to start a little bit smaller, but you know, if there's one thing that's happened during COVID is that everyone realizes that telemedicine kind of respects everyone's time a little bit more than standing in the waiting room. So I feel like, you know, you've got the right fundamentals. It's about, you know, bringing team together of people who either care enough to be, you know, in this space themselves and to bring those people together and to look for co-creation, efforts of co-creation. You know, that's, that's the first step. And then it's really about charting a course forward that will you know try and achieve the goals of the group uh, one thing that i've seen is that people that come together into this revolution as you said uh really enter in a way and, and evolve dramatically uh right away as a community and, and as a person so the question is how did you change in the past years because you were in touch with this information in this community and how you've seen other professionals doctors and people in general who, who are touched by this new way of thinking and, and engaging and, and how their lives have improved because of it. I did a tour. I did a 26 city tour in a bus with my family in 2018. I wouldn't recommend doing that. But what I would say is that every moment on that tour, I was inundated with people whose lives have been you know, profoundly changed by functional integrated medicine and you know there were things that I would do differently again if I could do this whole thing again but one of the things I definitely wouldn't do differently is is made the forums and built the practitioner communities because it's meant a lot to a lot of people um, just here in Sacramento you know hearing doctors say that they got the confidence to practice in this way without being shunned by all of their peers because they had a couple of other doctors to run past cases with and say Hey, I'm seeing that like this person's autoimmune antibodies went away when I changed the diet. Like, are you seeing that? And they're saying, yeah, I'm seeing that. Whereas, you know, the immunologist is like, what? And the, you know, the family medicine doesn't get it. And primary care doesn't have time to even understand what you're saying. So, you know, that, that there's reinforcement of the power of community uh, to, you know, to support growth. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's affected a lot of people in a lot of ways. The most profound changes are where people reverse their own chronic disease. Because once you go through a process of reversing your own chronic disease, you have no doubt as to who has the Who, who, has, who has the strength and who has the sovereignty in your life, right? Because you just reversed your own chronic disease by doing those things right. And so that to me is like the biggest shift is that once people reverse a chronic illness, they never think the same way again. And either we're going to have to wait for everyone to get ill and then do it, or hopefully we're going to have to be able to go a little bit more upstream. And that's, that's the goal for the next 10 years. Like let's reduce unnecessary suffering as much as possible. What, what's your next book about, if you can tell us? I don't know. I haven't got another book. Um, I don't know. I thought about writing a uh, half autobiographical, half science fiction novel. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. It hasn't started yet, though. It's a bit outside of my box, but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I wrote I wrote an ebook recently that was focused on this thesis that I have for transforming chronic disease care around coaches and groups and sort of not putting doctors as the first port of call, even if they're functional doctors. Um, and so I, I just wrote an ebook about that that you can find at findfunctional.com. Um, that was really just sort of like a, a little effort at the thesis. I don't really think I'm going to write another book for a while, but I guess one of the things that I see, one opportunity is that, you know, that America may not be the most 
obvious place for this revolution to occur, right? America's got a lot of problems, but it's also, it's a good place to try new things because there's so many problems that solutions can be useful. But I look to somewhere like India, Victor, where you have 1.3 billion people, right? So a sixth of the world population. You have uh, a, an energy and a history of, of spiritualism and divinity and reverence. And you have a culture that was based in that. Then you have, you know, a healthcare system, a new, a new sort of creation of wealth. And I made a trip to India in March. I was invited out there by a guy who who started a company called Organic India, which is the biggest um, health, you know, biggest supplement company probably in the world. I think at this point they started, you know, 20 years ago. And he's got a big vision. He read my book and he liked it. So I would rather not write any more books and spend the next 10 years executing the ideas in this book. Because ultimately, if the ideas in this book are executed at any meaningful scale, it w the ripple effect will be transformational. And so uh, let's, let's say no books. <laughs> Sounds good to me, my friend. Okay. Um, what, what advice would you give me now that we are starting this podcast and we're bringing this community together in what, what we're calling Back to the Future, Transforming Health and, and Wellness? You know, I think one is is to just bring people together. I think it's the thing to do and I, even more needed today than it's ever been. You know, there are all kinds of ways to do it, but just like looking to find ways to create common commonality between people who want the same thing, I think is huge. You know, the second is, there's a lot of wisdom in like the pre-Spanish Mexican culture. And I think that finding ways to access that kind of wisdom, you know, can make a uniquely Mexican offering where it's not just, you know, there's a like whole Mexican tech world that's really exciting. But what is Mexican culture? Like, is it the Spanish Mexican culture? Is there a pre-Spanish Mexican culture? And what does that culture know about health that this culture has got drastically wrong? I think tapping into some of that will allow you to bring people back to sort of an inner knowing about what they're here to do. And secondly, to base something on something that everyone has like, they should have some some reverence for. So I think that would be, those would be the two two things that I would, as a starting point. And then I would say that the, 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 the thing that I found that I would say is think big, right? We need people who can think big. We need people who can think, okay, I want to drastically change the health of the Mexican people in the next two decades. I love that. I think it's Tony Robbins quote. He says, we all overestimate what we can do in one year and underestimate what we can do in 10. I'm 15 years into it, right? And I see what's happened already. And I'm, I'm not even 40 yet. So I'm still like, I'm in for the long term. So I'm excited about what we can do in my lifetime. And I know that you're excited about what's possible in, in Mexico. All right, James. So thank you so much for this uh, interview. You really, I can tell you how of a, how much of an example you are for me in, per, in, in personal terms, but also in inspiring a lot of people all over the world to really delve into this and, and really think deeply about the implications of, of daring, of dreaming this big, both for ourselves, our families, and our communities and societies. So thank you so much, and I hope to be uh, in touch. I hope so too. Have a great day. Thank you.